So we're now going to talk about the Java Common Fork Join Pool. We talked about it a bit over the course of other lessons, but let's really focus in on it now or start focusing in on it now. And we'll show how this is designed to maximize processor core utilization. Now, there's a static common fork join pool that comes out of the box. It's, it's always available. It's not always initialized, but it's always available. And for most programs that need to do concurrent processing with this divide and conquer like model that want to program at this level of abstraction, that's the right thing to do. And as they say in the movie, The Highlander, there can be only one. There's only one common fork join pool. This pool is used by any fork join task that's not submitted to a specific or specified pool. You can make your own pool that's not the common pool, and you can basically invoke or submit or execute tasks on it. But if you don't do that, it, it defaults to using the common fork join pool. Why do we do this, you may ask? Well, it helps to optimize resource utilization since that common pool is aware of all the cores that are used globally within a process, and more importantly, it's also aware of all the tasks that are in that common pool. And therefore, we can use all the cool work stealing stuff we talked about before to maximize utilization. So we're going to basically use work stealing to peg the, the performance meter to up as fast as we possibly can or as, as scalable as we possibly can by keeping all the cores hopping along doing something useful. This type of trade-off between global and local resource management is very common in lots of domains. It's, it's common, for example, in Java with Java's heap. So if you think about the Java heap, the way it works is you've got a global heap where all the memory comes from, and it's managed globally, therefore giving the ability of the garbage collected process that runs Java code to know all the memory that's allocated. So you can, it can do a hopefully do a more effective job of allocating things. There are other languages, particularly C++, that allow you to take control over the allocation of objects using local, local data stores as opposed to the global free store, the heap. Java wants you to kind of do it globally, and so it's a similar kind of idea. There's also other trade-offs in um, management, you know, business school management. Do you want to have global resource allocation within a company, local resource allocation, and there's always pros and cons, and, Inevitably, there's trade-offs, but this is the way it's done with the common fork join pool. This pool is also used by the Java Parallel Streams framework, and that's what you get out of the box with Parallel Streams. There's ways of circumventing this, but they're not really very portable, and they're somewhat ugly to use. But it's possible, but it's not easy. And the Java Completable Futures framework defaults to using the common fork join pool, although you can, in fact, override the pool that's used when you when you go ahead and submit something to the common fork join pools, supply a sync method. And we'll talk more about that when we get the, the common fork join pool and the computable futures. By default, the common fork join pool has one less thread than the number of cores that the underlying virtual machine or exec execution environment knows about. So you can see here we say uh, the way it works under the hood is that the common pool method that makes the common pool has one less than the number of processors. So for sake of argument, let's say we had a quad core processor, the parallelism level will be set to three. Why, and, and you can find out what the, what the parallelism level is by calling fork join pool get common pool parallelism. And it'll return to you the count, which is always one less than the number of cores. Why is there always one less than the number of cores, you might ask? And I might ask that on a quiz, so it's a good thing to know. The reason for that is that the invoking thread, in other words, the one that, in, that started things off in the pool, is also included. So let's say you have the main thread or the user interface thread or whatever, whatever it is you're using to go ahead and start up the pool and do work, that thread also pitches in, and therefore a program can leverage all the processor cores. So the pool, the common fork joint pool has number of processor cores minus one, and then the calling thread will make it the number of processor cores. So that's, that's how it works, and that's why it always has one less than the number of cores. However, there are circumstances in which the default number of threads in the fork joint pool may be inadequate. So here's an example. Let's say you've got four threads, and you've got 10 images to download. So you've got a lot more images to download than there are cores. 
if you only had the number of cores in the pool, then you would end up with either underutilization, because after four of these things blocked, then you would have nothing to do, even though there were plenty of cores available because the threads that are downloading are blocked, so they're not doing anything useful. Or you could actually end up with deadlock under some circumstances. We won't focus a lot on the deadlock part, but we will focus on the underutilization of processor core problem. And so what we'd like is some way to be able to expand the number of threads in the common fork join pool when there's blocking tasks going on, and then be able to contract it when there's less work, because we don't want to use resources unnecessarily if there's nothing, if they don't need to do anything. That gives it back to the global pool of resources. So there are two ways to do this. One is by modifying a system property. You can modify this property called Java Util Concurrent Fork Join Pool Common Parallelism, bit of a mouthful, and you can give it the desired number of threads. You can say, I want to have 10 threads in there. But there's a couple problems with this, the most obvious one being, how do you know how many threads you're going to need? Sometimes you don't know until the program runs. Like if you're downloading images, you don't know how many threads until you know how many images you have, and that could be dynamic. The other downside with this approach is that modifying this property here affects all the uses of a common fork join pool in a process. So everybody's going to have that many threads. And there's also some other mm, somewhat subtle and pernicious limitations to this approach. Namely, you can only change the size before the common fork join pool is initialized. And that's because the way it works under the hood is it uses a first time in initialization approach called lazy initialization. And the first time you go to access the common fork join pool, the threads are created. But after that point, if you try to set this property, it has no effect whatsoever. This approach is therefore limited. So we need to do something else that would be more dynamic. Manage blocker comes to the rescue. We've been talking about this in the context of the programming assignment. The manage blocker is the means by which you can dynamically expand and contract the common fork join pool. And the way this works is it will temporarily add worker threads to the common fork join pool. So if you need some extra threads because some threads are blocked, then it's smart enough to know how to add those threads as needed. Think of it kind of like seasonal work at K uh, Walmart or Amazon or something where they need people over the holidays to ship more stuff or to deal with more customers and so on, but they don't necessarily need them all year round. This is most useful when tasks wait on I.O. or block on I.O., on synchronizers, or on blocking queues. I should say and or on blocking queues. So anytime you're going to block, then this mechanism is very useful. However, managed blockers can only be used with the common fork join pool. That You cannot use them with your custom fork join pool, only the common fork join pool. It's a bit tricky to program this mechanism, so therefore we provide this blocking task abstraction, and I'll talk more about that in the next series of videos on the common fork join pool, but it's very helpful to abstract away from this because otherwise it's very low level gobbledygook that you don't want to have to keep rewriting every time you want to do a compensation mechanism in your use of the common fork join pool. The common fork join pool also reclaims threads if stuff isn't being used, if, if they're not being used, and it'll make them available to be reinstated later if you need to, but it reclaims them. So it's like the, the Grim Reaper or the Samsara wheel of life and death in, uh, I think that's Hinduism. So it, it allows them to be reincarnated and reused down the road. So that's the end of the discussion of the common fork join pool. The first shot at this, we will talk about this in more detail later.